Hello and welcome to Invertebrate Paleontology and Paleobotany at Utah State University. This is lecture 24 in which we'll answer the question, why study fossil plants? Now, unlike the invertebrate animals that we've been looking at in this course, most plants lack hard parts. Now, a few plants and parts of plants can be fairly hard and in that case they can be preserved in the rock record more than other parts of the plant. So for example, some algaes actually secrete calcium carbonate coats, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the different types of algae or protists that can be preserved either through uh, calcareous coats or even silica in the case of diatoms and flagellates. Uh, we also can have silica that's secreted by many plants and produce what are called phytoliths. We'll talk more about phytoliths later on this semester. Those are hard parts that can be preserved in the rock record as well. Now, uh, seeds themselves tend to be a very hard part, and so when we talk about seed plants, some of those can actually have a calcareous um, uh, skeleton to them or, or, or hard part to them, and so they can be preserved. Uh, wood, which is very hard, and we use it as a building material, is often preserved. And what's interesting about fossil wood, petrified wood, is that it's often replacement of silica or calcium carbonate, calcite, into the original organic matter that composed the wood. Although there is another process of uh, colification, that is uh, under heat and pressure, changing the uh, wood into smaller chains of hydrogen and carbon. Those polymers become smaller and they get compressed. That's the process of colification and that occurs with heat and pressure. So oftentimes you can get the formation of coal, of petrified silicious uh, fossil wood or a calcite um, petrified wood. Now most fossil, fossil leaves are preserved as either impressions of the leaf, so this is kind of like a mold and cast that you can get sometimes, or they're compressed organic matter. So these are carbon rich organic matter that's preserved on the surface of many, most of the time it's on shales or mudstones, although you can get it on some fine grained sandstones. Now fossil plants are very plentiful in terrestrial systems and one of the nice things about terrestrial plants is they give us a good indication of what the environment was like in Earth's history on land and so they give us a good insight into what are the types of plants that were living there and give us insight onto the ecosystems of the terrestrial realm. And so that's one of the reasons I like focusing on paleobotany with this course is it's a really important to uh, be able to read the rocks in, 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 in terms of looking at the terrestrial ecosystems. Although many of the groups we'll discuss in this class are also found in marine systems such as the protists and the algaes and some of the photosynthesizing organisms that live in the oceans today. Um, petrified wood is extremely common in uh, terrestrial systems. Uh, so this is a fossilized log at the Petrified National Forest in Arizona. So these are really important sites, um, but petrified wood is, is abundant and very, very commonly found in many rock units. This is an example of an impression of a fossil leaf. Uh, so the leaf was there and it sort of uh, pressed into the sandstone and it was able to preserve the features. And so you, enough of the morphology of this fossil leaf is preserved that we can actually identify it. But it's oftentimes in shales in which you get the best preservation of fossil leaves. So this is a shale from the fluorescent fossil beds in Colorado where you get this wonderful um, breakage pattern and you get this wonderful leaf pattern. Um, and so these leaves can be very uh, detailed and intricate in terms of the preservation. We can tell a great deal. We can even tell what types of insects were feeding on these leaves as well. Now we have a record of fossil leaves going back into some of the earliest of the land plants. This is an example of a Carboniferous uh, fossils from uh, Pennsylvania. Some pretty exciting stuff that you can find and we can, we can trace the, the evolution of plants through many of these fossils. Now fossil plants don't necessarily need to be impressions of leaves or, or fossil leaves um, or petrified wood. They can be other things as well. These are what are called coal balls and these occur in Appalachia where you get these um, limestones. This is a limestone that's embedded within 
a coal bed and these can actually preserve many times different components of the plant or the 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 uh, plants that were living at the time in the forest in these sort of coal balls and so they're oftentimes uh, studied either uh, dissolved out of some of the calcium carbonate to get the organic matter as well in these coal balls or actually studied underneath a microscope to try to understand some of the plants that are actually contained in these things. Because what's often preserved with plants is actually the uh, organic matter you can actually one of the things that many people do is using a variety of different acids they try to etch away the, the surrounding matrix and to hold together those that organic matter so it doesn't fall apart oftentimes paleobotanists will use sheets of acetate or some side of plastic that they can apply and protect to hold together the organic matter as they dissolve away the calcium carbonate or the the silica away from the uh, the fossil plant and so these are transferred over. Um, sometimes these can be transferred over in serial cross-sections of a particular uh, rock and where you get some great preservation. And this is a great way of getting into the detail, the internal anatomy of these plants. Another place that uh, fossils, uh, fossil plants are often found are in concretions, iron concretions. The most famous uh, locality where iron concretions are found are the Mason Creek uh, localities and where you basically find these concretions you break them apart and oftentimes you find plant material within these iron concretions. Uh, what's interesting is it might be the actual plants that are laid down and get surrounded by these concretions that help to actually form and protect them from the surrounding mudstones. Now collecting fossil plants is a bit different than collecting invertebrates um, where oftentimes when you're collecting invertebrates you're just going along the surface and you're looking for anything that's exposed. Because fossil plants are made out of this organic matter and so they're very fragile, so if they're exposed to the surface they oftentimes will uh, weather away and disappear. So what paleobotanists do in collecting is they go out and they basically try to uncover, peel back uh, various layers, various shales and open up and try to get as broad of a surface as possible and as they split open those shales and expose that they often will find as they split the shales uh, fossil leaves, um, bits and pieces of fragments of plant material. So collecting uh, uh, fossil plants is a bit different. The tools of the trade are rock saws, jackhammers, and big huge giant sledgehammers that are used to break apart uh, these big huge slabs. And the reason you're going for really big slabs is you want to have a um, nice uh, preserved complete specimen. And so if you are breaking apart you know, little teeny pieces, the chance of you breaking through uh, one of the leaves or something like that um, and destroying it are much greater. So the bigger slab you pull up and flip over to look at, uh, the more chance you're going to get a complete specimen, a complete leaf that you can uh, that you can study. All right, so what I thought I'd do is go through a little bit about uh, the leaf and wood anatomy of plants um, and talk about the various layers. So this is a typical cross section of a typical leaf, and on the upper side, so the side that shines to the sun, that gets the most sunlight, the direct sunlight, um, we have a thin membrane that's, uh, that's called the cuticle. And this is a waterproof uh, membrane that's on the top and uh, it's, it's basically kind of almost like a, a waxy surface on top of the leaf. And this prevents water loss because, uh, because these, these leaves are trying to do photosynthesis, they want to be up in the light and oftentimes the sunlight is very hot and so it dry out the leaf and kill the plant very quickly if it didn't have this cuticle. Amazingly, sometimes these cuticles actually preserve in uh, the fossil record and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on and some of the uses of that cuticle uh, when they are preserved. Underneath the cuticle is an upper epididymis, um, so the kind of outer cell layers. And then we have the palisade layer underneath that. Um, and in all these cells that are underneath we have chloroplasts and we'll talk a little bit more in detail with chloroplasts because that is the photosynthesizing organelles of the, of the cells within plants. In vascular plants you have vascular bundles. These are going to be bundles of cells that help transport water which is very vital to these cells as well as transport 
um, sugars and various nutrients to other cells that may not necessarily be uh, in that photic uh, zone where you're getting lots of sunlight. And then underneath that, you have these sort of these chambers that open up. They have like a door on the underside of the leaf, and those doors are called stoma. And the reason that you have these chambers in stoma is to get rid of the buildup of oxygen, which is then released through the stoma. Here's a really nice image of the cuticle. So the cuticle is acellular, so there's no cells there. It's just basically secreted on the surface of the leaf. Um, and so that helps protect, it's a waterproof uh, zone there that helps to protect, but it's transparent so it allows the sunlight to shine through. Now chloroplasts can be seen in all uh, plant cells um, and in many algae cells that we'll talk about later in the next, uh, the next lecture. So chloroplasts are these organelles within the cells that are involved in photosynthesis and um, they're often green in color and this is one of the reasons that plants are green is because their cells are covered in chlor chloroplast uh, organelles which have uh, green, blue, and yellow pigments that make green. Now the stoma, the stoma on the, the bottom part of the plant, these are the doors that open up. Uh, in many plants these open up only at night to release the buildup of oxygen. And they do that because um, in the heat of the day, they don't want to lose too much uh, moisture. So many plants um, rely on water for the process of photosynthesis. And they're very, uh, by kind of opening and closing these doors on the bottom part of the leaf, the stoma, they can regulate how much water is lost. And so these are stoma, and you can actually see these under a microscope on the, on the bottom surface of leaves. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about the anatomy of wood and what wood is. So wood is composed of various organic carbon uh, chains. They're bonded to hydrogen and phosphorus and nitrogen, um, these long polymers of carbon. And there's a variety of different ones. Um, the first is the cellulose. The cellulose is these very stiff, fibrous um, molecules that develop and grow out, um, and this really provides the rigid framework of the wood. These are surrounded by hemicellulose that kind of wrap around and kind of hold the fabric together, and then sprinkled in between uh, these various layers are some um, polymers that kind of hold everything together. This includes lignin and pectin, and these basically are uh, hold the tissue of the wood together. And then you have vascular bundles uh, where water can flow through capillary pressure um, through the wood and help to uh, provide uh, water to those leaf structures up in the higher parts of the plant. All right, so the real purpose of, of, of stilling pa uh, paleobotany is that fossil plants tell us a great deal about the ancient terrestrial environment. So they can tell us uh, things about um, how much atmospheric CO2 was there at, at particular points in time, um, how much precipitation, how much rain, how much snow, what the annual and seasonal temperatures were like. Um, fossil plants give us a, a proxy for figuring out what the ancient uh, temperatures were like, especially in terrestrial places where we can't use isotopes in the same manner as we can in deep marine benthic systems. They also gives us useful information about uh, the environment, how much sunlight there was. They are probably the most important thing to look at if you're interested in past elevation. So depending on how high certain mountain ranges will be will affect the types of plants that would grow on those mountainsides. And so this is really important for tectonic reconstructions is being able to study fossil plants. And the other thing is fossil plants to give us a, a good insight into the terrestrial paleoecology of various sites. So this is one of the reasons why studying fossil plants is particularly important and why we cover it in this class. All right, thanks for watching this quick introduction on paleobotany. If you're interested in taking a course at Utah State University in geology, check out our website, department website at geology.usu.edu. And if you're interested in my research and who I am, check out my website at benjamin slash burger dot o r g. Thank you again for watching. Take care.